Uh, welcome everyone uh, again. Uh, we've uh, we waited just a few minutes to get started. Uh, give some some of the latecomers a, a chance to get in and everyone to get uh, any potential issues they might have had uh, getting online here. So um, with that, I'd like to thank all of you for for joining us for this public meeting about Capital School Park. My name is Michael Ike. I am the project manager working for the City and Borough of Juneau uh, Engineering Department. We also have on the panel this evening, uh, participating in the meeting, we have Michelle Elfers, the Deputy Director of Parks and Rec for CBJ. We have Zane Jones, who is a project manager for MRV Architects. We have Monique Anderson from Anderson Land Planning and Kevin Jeffrey also from MRV Architects. Uh, and working in the background is Lauren Varelli with CBJ Parks and Rec, uh, and we appreciate what she's doing to facilitate the meeting. Before we uh, get too far into it, we would like to respectfully acknowledge that Capitol School Park is within and near lands of the Aquan and Taku Club. So our meeting objectives this evening, um, we'll have a brief project introduction that includes myself and Michelle. Uh, Zane and Kevin are going to talk about the uh, existing site conditions um, and then and results from the community survey. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and we'll continue with some information on the park design concepts from Monique and then we'll finish up with a question answer period. Uh, that we can all participate in. Uh, when we do get to the question and answer period, those of you online can submit questions through the, the Q&A box. Uh, for those of you that have called in on the phone, you can hit star nine to indicate that you um, have a question you'd like to ask. Um, our objective is we wanna make sure that everyone uh, is involved and is informed uh, for, the, for the project and throughout the process. Uh, we really appreciate everyone that participated in the survey um, last last month and into this month, and we certainly appreciate your participation this evening. Uh, and I encourage you to offer feedback, uh, both uh, through the Q&A uh, later in, in our uh, presentation, uh, but also after the presentation, um, if you have some questions or some comments that you would, um, that you would like to offer, uh, feel free to email me um, and I'll get those to the appropriate individuals. Um, anyone that is interested will have an opportunity later in our presentation for you to sign up for an email list uh, where you can receive uh, important updates on the project. Yeah, you can also find information on the project webpage, which can be found through the CBJ Parts and Rec webpage. So for Capital School Park, we've planned for a construction budget of $1.4 million. The funding comes primarily from sales tax revenue and, um, I'm sorry, partially from sales tax revenue with a balance of the funding coming from the October 2020 voter approved bond initiative. In addition to MRV Architects, who's, who's the lead on the uh, design project, Anderson Land Planning, we also have P&D engineers who are going to provide structural and civil engineering services for the project. Um, those services will necessarily include addressing the existing concrete retaining wall at the playground area that is nearing the end of its useful life. Shouldn't be a surprise to many of you as that was definitely something that was made note of on a lot of the survey responses. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle, and she's going to talk a little bit about how we got here and the intent of the project. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Michelle Alfers. I'm the Deputy Director of Parks and Recreation Department. And um, like Michael said, I'll talk a little bit about this park, um, some background and how it fits into our park system overall. Um, but first, I just want to say that I've noticed um, on this meeting, I'm really excited to see we have a lot of people joining. Um, we have uh, a few members from our Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, um, which is really great. Uh, they're the folks who represent the community on park issues and devote a lot of time. So thanks for being here. And um, we also have uh, members of our Park Foundation, which is a nonprofit that works on um, supporting, advocating, and uh, fundraising for Juno Park. So um, thanks to you folks. And, and then I noticed lots of neighbors. 
um, of the park, which is great, and, and lots of other folks that I talk to regularly about parks. So thanks everybody um, for being here and we're really excited um, to hear what you have to say and learn about the park through your eyes. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about um, this park and, and how it fits into our park system. So it is categorized in our master plan as a neighborhood park, um, which means it intends to serve the neighborhood around it. Um, it, is, uh, it is supposed to have structured and unstructured activities, which is um, what this park has. It has some uh, basketball court, it's got playground features, and it's got some passive areas for taking a stroll, sitting down, or, or playing in a field. So, um, so we do have that type of activity. It's similar to Rotary Park in the Valley. That's also a neighborhood park. Um, if you go to our master plan, which was adopted in 2019 by the assembly, um, you can read all about, master, about um, neighborhood parks and, and what um, is appropriate for that level of park. But I did want to point it out because I think there's some, um, there's some interesting things about Capitol Park that do make it a little bit different from some of our other neighborhood parks. In that master plan, um, we started the process uh, with a survey and um, we had two types of surveys at the time. We had a telephone survey with, that was done by McDowell Group um, that was you know, statistically um, accurate. And then we also had a less formal online survey. In total, we had about 800, over 800 respondents, uh, responses. And um, pretty much for both types of surveys, we um, learned that 15 to 20% of the respondents have visited Capitol Park in the last year. And the median number of visits was 15 over the year. So I look at those numbers and I think, wow, this is a little bit more than a neighborhood park. Like there's a lot of people coming. It's not just this, the people who live in the streets around the park. And, you know, I know that for many of you on the phone, it's your backyard and, and that's where you play and recreate and um, can walk there from your house easily. Um, and it's also for many uh, state employees, people who work downtown and legislative employees, it's where they go for their lunch breaks um, and to take a stroll. And um, I also know it's a destination because I, I go there and I take my kids there. Um, and it's a schoolyard because uh, Discovery Preschool is right there and they use this park every day, rain or wind or shine, they are out there every day. So it serves a lot of purposes. Um, and I, and I, we recognize it is a really important park in our park system. We have prioritized it in our CIP for many years. Um, we've been working on building funding through sales tax. Um, and then this fall, as Michael mentioned, um, we voters approved um, sales, uh, bond sales um, for park projects. And this was one of our top priorities. So um, with those bond sales, we'll be able to move into uh, park reconstruction, um, which we're really excited about. And um, we're here to listen to you tonight. Um, we heard what you said in the survey. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. And we wanna get more feedback. Um, it's gonna move, this, this process will move pretty quickly, um, but we still have time after this meeting to hear what you have to say. So there'll be an email at the end of the project um, and um, on our website, on our Parks and Rec uh, page on the city website, juno.org. Um, there's contact information, more information about this project. So please be in touch with us and we wanna hear from you. Thank you. Okay, so before I start on the timeline, this is somewhat tentative, but this is what we, our best guess, what we anticipate will happen. We're currently at step one. Uh, that includes the, the survey that we conducted, this meeting, uh, gathering the public input, developing concepts for the updated master plan. Uh, I want to point out that depending on costs relative to our budget for some of the components of the park, uh, we may not be able to do everything in this construction project, it may it may become phased and happen in later construction phases. Um, MRV and their design partners will prepare bid rate construction documents in the next few months. And then we anticipate that we would go out to bid sometime in May uh, with a hopeful construction date uh, sometime this summer. Uh, and construction um, on this park would be likely to occur over a three to four month period, give or take a little bit. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Zane and Kevin, and they're gonna talk about the survey and the existing site conditions. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Jeffrey with MRV Architects. 
Um, thank you so much for filling out the community survey. 214 of y'all filled out this survey last month coming into this one. And it was very, very insightful. And we loved reading all the responses. And I'm going to share just the highlights um, today with y'all. But at the end of this meeting on the project page, there will be an attachment with the full range of responses, including all the open responses of words that people wrote down. So if anybody wants to look at all the information, it will be there um, for you. So first we'll start with the poll question. So move around your mouse a little bit. Did you take the awesome Capital Park Community Vision Assessment Survey? So out of the people watching with us, how many have actually filled out that survey we put out? I'm just gonna let this go for about 30 seconds. So 10 more seconds. Okay, coming up on the end. There we go. So that, if you wanna go ahead and close the survey, here are the results. So most of y'all did, but there are some people here that did not. So that's good. It'll be um, informative for everyone. And this is just the beginning. We're going to be taking some more polling questions later. So on to the responses. I'm just going to go from left to right here, starting with the top. How frequently do people use the park? Um, a few times a month is in the red and the leading with 34, just over 34% but there are a lot of people who use it for special occasions and multiple times a day, which is seen in the blue. Um, how do you access the park? No surprise here, most of people are, are walking to the park at 78%, but there are um, about 17% of y'all that um, come via car too. Um, on to the bottom left, what do you use when you're in the park? Um, the teal at the bottom of the, the bar graph here is walking trails inside the park. That's the highest response right there for that question. But it's also followed up by the picnic areas. And then in the red, we have the playground for the five to 12 year olds. And then in the bottom right, why do you come? Um, the location is convenient seems to be the largest answer. Um, it's right next to downtown. It's nestled into uh, a very uh, active neighborhood. So that is, that is um, on par for the course there. And then it provides some amenities they want to use. So playing in picnic area, that's that little pie slice in the red. Next slide, please. And this, what you're looking at is a word cloud. We asked everyone to, in the survey, to name one word of what they thought of when they thought of Capitol School Park. And what you're seeing is the correlation of that in the form of a cloud. The bigger the word, the more people actually use that word. So convenient right in the middle, a lot of people use that, but there's also some negative words too, like dilapidated, outdated, neglected. Um, I think the range of answers run the gambit because we also have some hopeful things like potential, um, but there are some things to take note of like dog bombs. So just another way of visualizing the data, but here's what people are saying about the park. And then we wanted to know how many of y'all participated in the 2012 um, master planning done by Corvus Design and it was, kind of surprising that a lot of people did not um, participate in a 2012 survey uh, process. Um, that's exciting because we're getting some new people, maybe new people um, in the community, um, but it'll be um, something we look forward as we go on here. Um, for those with children, we asked about playground options to replace some of the playground amenities currently there on the park. And we're just trying to get a feel of the theme. And the theme of castles um, was not a winner. That's option one on the blue slice. But uh, the red one in the middle is option two. Most of, oh, just over 50% of people who responded to this question um, preferred that one, which is kind of nondescript and keeping to the theme and not too flashy because it is in the middle of the neighborhood. Um, next slide, please. 
So what you're looking at here is a stacked bar chart where we asked out of some of the existing amenities and amenities that we're looking at adding, how important did you think that was to include in the park? So the purple and the green are agreement of that needed to be included in the park. That was really important. And at the bottom of these, this chart is where people strongly disagreed or didn't have an opinion. So um, on the basketball area, about just doing quick math here, a little over 35% of people agreed that that was important. But moving on up to the outdoor fitness um, equipment, there's a lot of people who were interested in the idea, um, just about 60%. And the most agreements in, in terms of importance was right in the middle, the cultural features. Um, there are a lot of um, cultural features in the park, the main one being the empty chair memorial, but there are totem poles, there are historic signs of the neighborhood, but there's also dedication trees and, and dedication lilac bushes and a dedication boulder in the park. So there are a lot of personal features that have been added to the park over time. Um, musical instruments is not too far behind it with over 50% in agreement that this is something important to look at. And then we have community garden, which edges out that just a little bit, sitting right at 30% actually of having some community garden space. And switching gears of the type of question, we then ask people um, what's already there and how how important do you think that is to just the overall feel of the new the new park design? And so what you're looking at is a ranking from one on the left, which is the dark blue being the most important. I feel this is the really the most important thing in the park to the lighter green eight as the least important thing in the park. So if you see something leaning to the left, people are thinking that's more important than others. If you've seen it leaning to the right, um, you're, people are thinking that it is less important than other things. If you see a U shape, there's a, there's a, there's a mixed opinion about what's going on. So just on the, the left one, Sledding Hill, um, it's leaning towards the left at 40 people saying it's the most important thing in the park, but there is a kind of a bump towards the bottom there. Um, the basketball area, um, it is leaning right, but there is kind of a U-shaped um, within the data here of the bars between the green and the red. So there's, there's a mixed opinion. A lot of people use that space. Um, for artificial play field area, although the left word most important is the highest responses, everything else is kind of flat. So that just tells us that um, there's no clear kind of winner or decision on the artificial play fields, and it's something we'll have to look closer at. Um, for the cultural features, this is um, leaning leftward, but it's definitely on the higher echelon of importance for capital school parks. Okay, um, this is four other amenities and features that we, are, we asked about. Um, the community garden and orchard, as, um, proposed in the 2012 master plan, um, sitting right at the middle, the highest responses is kind of um, neutral. Um, so people could take it or leave it just based on these responses, which is only 214. It's not the entire community. Um, picnic plaza area, plaza picnic areas in the arbor, which is just kind of a, a covered space. Um, people like this idea. Um, because it's definitely leftward leaning. There's not too many people thinking it's not important. Um, so that's good to see. And then art, um, I would like to say that there is a U shape in the middle of this thing between the magenta and the orange. Although it's rightward leaning, we do feel that art is important and we're gonna to continue to um, not only keep the existing artwork, but um, look at opportunities to add more. And then finally, the fenced dog area. Um, I think maybe the key word being fenced, but here's the giant U shape I was mentioning to y'all earlier, interpreting the data. Um, opinions are mixed on this one. It is rightward leaning, but there are, are a lot of people who bring their pets over here and um, it is an important feature of the park. 
So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Zane Jones, and he can talk more about the present existing features. Oh, right, yeah. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for being the whiz behind the scenes on getting all that data collected and, and crunched for us. Um, so I'm going to talk about the existing conditions and where the park's at right now. Um, one thing I want to point out to you is a lot of the diagrams we're going to be showing and some of the concepts are going to be in in plan view, which is, which is, you know, like this aerial here. So you're going to be looking down on the plan or on the park, but it's actually got a lot of topography to it. It's a fairly steep site in a few locations. So um, our concepts use that topography and try to take the best advantage of it. So I just want to, to point out here the this upper area, <clears throat> it, and this might be, you know, familiar with people that use the park, but for those that aren't, um, just wanted to go over it quickly. It's fairly steep up here, um, and it's got some existing um, fruit trees, I think crab apple primarily, and, um, and same with over here on this edge, it sort of cascades down, as you can see, some of these um, tiered, tiered places. And this wall right here is the one we'll be talking about that is, is really driving a lot of the project. It's um, a very old wall, um, basically the foundation wall or retaining wall for the Capitol School Park, which is where the park gets, or the Capitol School building, I should say, um, that's no longer there and where the park gets its name. Um, it's got quite a bit of um, crumbling and some exposed rebar and that sort of thing. So it really needs to be replaced. Um, and it is holding up this slope right here that it is acting as a retaining wall. So it's an important um, piece of engineering that we're gonna be um, addressing. And then of course we've got by the wall and a lot of our concepts continue this is um, the playground area. And here in the center, uh, we've got sort of the big flat area um, over here in the lower right, we've got the um, empty chair memorial and some nice landscaping and a path. Um, and then down here, we've got maples along fifth and, and some landscaping that, that you'll see in our concepts. Won't, there won't be much changing in, in some of this area. And, and likewise, there's not gonna be any sort of dynamite moves here to the park. Um, I think a lot of these things um, are gonna be budget driven and we're gonna make the best with what we um, are allowed budget-wise to work with. Um, the last element being the, um, we hesitate to even call it a dog park. We, we've switched the name to dog relief area. It's quite small up here and it's, uh, um, yeah, it's basically only, only enough room for dog relief. There's no uh, room to, you know, throw a ball or anything like that. Um, the last feature, this sloped area here, um, is used as a sledding hill quite often. Um, so we'll, we'll go over that. Um, basketball court is right here currently. And then <clears throat> our little bit of um, parking and we've got a drinking fountain and a couple picnic area, um, picnic table that is over here. So we'll go over those um, in, in greater detail as, as it comes. The uh, existing um, status, there's some drainage issues that we'll address uh, in the park. We were there today actually and it was uh, Quite apparent, so we're we're definitely aware of the issues and, and hoping to address them. Um, this is a plan view, just of existing conditions, basically going over exactly what we have. We do have uh, it modeled in three dimensions, so we can take a look at it and get get views if people are curious. Um, go here to the historic image, um, and we've got a couple ideas that that we want to give a nod to history, and that you'll see come up a little later. But this is the Capital School um, back in in the day when it was um, present there. So some of these features, um, these entry stairs, um, are essentially still there. A lot of this um, stair and sidewalk remains fairly similar. So you'll see that in the park design. Um, some of these retaining walls, we aren't quite sure on all the history of them, but there's uh, there's definitely an echo of the past that's still there and in this shape. So we'll we'll hopefully see if that can can uh, be remembered. And with that, I'll turn the, the microphone over to Monique Anderson with Anderson Land Planning. Thank you, Zane, and good evening, everyone. I'm Monique Anderson, landscape architect at Anderson Land Planning, and I've been practicing in Alaska for over 20 years, both in the capacity as a designer and as a parks and recreation manager. 
And I've recently been in Sitka for the past 10 years. And the most recent relevant project there, um, maybe you have visited is the Sitka Community Playground. But now you know a little bit about me. And since I can't see you, one of the things that you can do to communicate with us is to type in your questions as they come up in the Q&A um, box down at the bottom of the Zoom panel. And the amazing Zane will be monitoring that and then curating those questions for our Q&A session at the end. You can also feel free to add some complimentary comments to the project team. We've worked hard on this presentation for you tonight. But thank you for being here. Um, really appreciate your time. So it is important to remember that we're building on the 2012 master plan effort. We're not starting from scratch here. And I really love this question. If there's one thing you could change, what would that be? And I've summarized your responses into six main categories. Uh, the first one being the strong preference for some better playground equipment. And it goes without saying that we're looking at accessible and inclusive playground structures. And there was a lot of interest in adding some rock climbing features and some better swings. Uh, another theme was to keep the basketball and we all recognize that it's a healthy space for um, people of all ages, um, particularly that teen group, which isn't serviced by sometimes the typical playground equipment, but maybe they will go play some ball together. Um, another main theme was we heard a lot of people who did not want to see artificial turf. They wanted to keep it more natural and grassy. And we're certainly looking at that opportunity um, as well as recognizing the limitations of what natural turf can do, especially in our Southeast environment. So we did hear you on that, thank you. And then um, definitely interest in even expanding what exists in the seating and picnic space areas, possibly adding some covered picnic tables or seating areas and keeping it organic and um, ability to have relaxing places on the site. And I know that covering any sort of, um, any element in the park can bring in some different users to the park that we might not want to encourage. So we will tread carefully on that issue. Um, we are aware of all that's happening in your downtown area. And then garden space, a lot of comments about that, that perhaps maybe um, the garden might be better suited in that Southwest area along Seward Street and um, maybe enhancing uh, the fruit production for in the downtown area with the uh, addition of an orchard. And then what can I say? There were lots and lots of comments about dogs, both for and against. Um, so certainly something to keep in mind through all our designs. And then one comment that's not reflected on that was um, plumbed restrooms. And we recognize that adding plumbed restrooms is a desire by many people but it's a very expensive endeavor. It would probably be more than half of the project budget. So at this time, it's not something that Parks and Rec is pursuing. But I learned today from the maintenance staff that it has been successful to have a seasonal porta potty on the site. And perhaps we can look, look at locating that um, and giving it kind of a more permanent spot with a, a formal screen around it. Um, so that's the restroom update. So I think some of your comments were um, just amazing. Um, I was very impressed by 214 people doing the survey and I did read through all of the open-ended responses. And here's what you had to say about the future of the park. I thought some of these comments summed it up well. At the heart, this really is a neighborhood park. Um, although as Michelle was saying, we recognize that given its location so close to the Capitol building and all that is um, happening downtown, that there um, are a lot of different users that do use the site. So when we're approaching our design, we're looking to keep things year round and versatile for everyone. Great, so what's going to be in the park? Probably no big surprises here. On the left, you'll see what I'm calling the core park program. And most of these elements are very satisfying for year round and versatile uses. And then on the right are some more optional kind of features. 
And certainly as funding permits, some of these might even be able to come in at a later phase. So I think we're gonna to advance to the next poll question, which is out of all of these optional items, which do you think is the most important for us to consider? I think there's probably a few seconds left on this. And the results. Oh, right. So it looks like interesting. So um, definite support, fitness equipment, community garden, orchard space, some outdoor classroom art. Great. That's great feedback. Thank you very much for that. Perfect. So designers love taking pen to paper and exploring lots of ideas and relationships. Uh, between the different elements. Um, these are probably four of literally 20 that I did. Um, all of these started to hone in on uh, what I did um, to create the play space in relation to the sledding hill. So sort of taking the playground space, which is right now shoved more to the left side of the park and bringing it into um, next to where the sledding hill is. And it's kind of more in the sunnier spot of the site as well. And all of these are different variations of how I could handle the staircase access to the upper part of the park and the different relationships between them. So I just wanted to give you the sneak peek of what goes on behind the scenes. And then as we advance into the more refined drawings, um, I've got three options to sort of go through with you. And this park concept one, divides the space into a, a kind of a basketball court area, a mega playground and the sledding hill with some um, stair access to the upper area. And the rest of the walkways remain very formalized like you saw in the 2012 master plan. The little memorial stays off, the empty chair memorial stays off to the right. And um, yeah, so very straight and formal kind of approach. And then if we advance to the next park concept. So if we're looking in the upper left, so we have here where I chose to take the staircase into the middle of the space to break it into basically two different zones. So we would have the separation of a taut area and the older child area would be separated. And it still included the basketball court area. But then I also chose to sort of loosen the rest of the walkways and create um, a nice walking meandering path around the kind of the, the lower half of the park. And then on the park concept three, I explored doing a terrain, um, terrain feature slide, a hill slide would be a name for it. Um, it does take up a lot of space. And after I added all the other elements in, what I couldn't fit in, which was lost, was the, um, the, the hard surface court area. But you'll see another attempt at, okay, how could walkways work in this scenario too, where kind of have the double loop kind of experience. So taking kind of the best of all three of those, um, uh, we have the draft, and I'll just emphasize draft, um, updated master plan. And I'm gonna walk through each of these main zones and give you some more information about them. All right, so the, the first zone is definitely centered around what is the major effort of this renovation project, and that is the wall. And we've had um, a lot of early discussions with our structural engineers, and we're looking at having to replace both the existing timber wall and that um, kind of crumbling uh, concrete wall. And they looked at all sorts of ways how they could do it. And the one that they're sort of leaning towards the most is pouring a new concrete wall about three feet in front or sort of down the hill of the existing wall and then getting in all their foundation drains 
Um, so that's their preferred method. And then instead of having a timber wall, um, transitioning to a concrete block wall. So what that does by moving the wall three feet down the hill, it opens up that area to actually become, become quite a lovely upper path area. And even in today's weather, when we did our site visit, um, you could really tell the views from up there are tremendous. And so uh, this park concept takes advantage of that additional terrain um, at that upper level. And you can kind of have a nice bird's eye view of what's going on in the playground below you. And then with the um, addition of the new central staircase in this scenario, um, you really have, you can foster the traffic up and down very nicely and even have this possibility of having the play structure connect with the upper level to create a multi-level play experience. And then you'll see on the left that there's the um, kind of basketball court area with perhaps some addition of fitness equipment that is in that space, maybe attached to the wall. Um, there's the concept of a fenced taut area with swings, which is very important to a lot of users. And in our discussions with the preschool users who are really down the, on this site every day, no matter what the weather, um, they really do have that preference for having it fenced. It helps in their um, facilitation with their children. And then the middle slide or the, the middle stairs with a potential slide, composite structure, and then the sledding hill. So all of, all of this layout is kind of the forming playrooms and we're really trying to take advantage of that multi-level play in different views. So here are some quick sketches um, to show this in section view on the left, what um, to do the actual construction of the new wall and the concrete block wall, the engineers haven't determined exactly how far uphill the disturbance effects will be, but we expect them to be fairly significant. So it is likely that that whole upper area, which is about at a two to one slope, will end up getting um, the trees would get cut down and that whole slope would be redone through this construction effort. So it's just one of the after effects of doing the concrete wall that we need to address what's going to be happening in this upper tier area. And so on this diagram, you see the shadow of where the existing wall is and the new wall being poured a couple, couple feet downhill with the idea of having some structure of the, of the playground structure connect to that new upper path. And then on the right is a nod to the history of the site, perhaps as the structures um, meets with the wall, there's the echo of the past with the old portico gates. And um, here's just a, a quick sketch of how that could look. Great, so we have another poll for you so to keep you awake. So how do you like connecting the new play structure with the upper terrace to foster these various multi-level play loops? All right, okay, so I definitely think the results are skewed to some excitement for it. So that's great to hear. Thank you. Hey, Monique, let me interrupt. This is Zane. Um, we did have one question come in that's related to what we were just talking about. So maybe you can, we can back up for a second here. And sure. um, folks are wondering if this terrain up here can be regraded in any way or does it have to remain um, essentially as is? Uh, that is a great question, and we'll work with the engineers more on that, but they are um, open to discussions about that. Obviously, if we want to create a more orchard-type experience up there, we would be looking at having um, a center path and, you know, kind of leveling a small area. So I think there is the ability to do some small terracing, nothing too significant that would require additional structures. And, okay. and there is a slide later that I'll show that a little bit more, but thank you oh, for great. that question. Yeah, okay, we'll carry on. Great. 
So now we're going to be talking more about the lower part of the park. And I really want to emphasize that there are some very nice features in the park right now. Um, the line of maple trees along Fifth Avenue are exquisite, um, just beautiful. So a lot of the features, you know, so that would remain. And then the big vegetation bed that is just uphill of the wall um, is also quite nice. And the empty chair memorial is very special. So <clears throat> the idea behind this um, design is to be fairly budget conscious and connect into the existing features which are working well and hopefully dovetail those well so that it all flows where it makes sense. <coughs> Excuse me. So what you have here is instead of, as the 2012 master plan divided the space, one contiguous lawn, and then there are some potential gateway access points into that more central space. And it's something that we can talk about with a little bit of additional fencing and then adding some opening and closing gates. That whole core area could really be separated from the rest of the park users, particularly for child supervision. That came up as one of the top things that uh, the preschool group was interested in, you know, because kids like to dart really fast out of the area they're supposed to be staying. So with some perimeter um, access points closed off, that makes it a little bit easier to um, keep the containment factor in. <coughs> and then the other thing I'd emphasize in here is that we have created a few additional picnic locations, and there certainly could be more. And some, like maybe one or two of these could be covered standalone or, or not. So there's a little bit of flexibility at this point. But the existing timber wall edge that does that is already on site, we're looking to be able to match up to that. And that helps create that border effect. And then another possibility in this space is an outdoor classroom area. In the past, um, just to the right of the memorial area, there have been some garden beds that were used. Then they were taken out um, because they were rotting. But there is interest from the preschool group also to have some of these more outdoor classroom opportunities. So there is some space for that to occur. Okay, great. Okay, so this is just a check-in to see um, if it's even worth our while to pursue this idea of having these gated fenced entries. And it would need to be three of them, kind of one on either end and then one coming up from the little picnic space, picnic table that exists from Fifth Avenue. Okay, so a little bit, um, yeah, two thirds of you did support that. So that's interesting. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so we started talking a little bit about this, but this upper hillside, as I mentioned, will end up getting disturbed from the wall construction. So here's an idea of how that could look afterwards, after we reworked it with a small terrace for where the gravel path would be mid, mid slope, and then potentially some stair access points down to that. And then um, fruit trees, uh, we certainly would be looking for a project partner to help guide us with uh, what would be acceptable here, but you could see kind of pretty much anything, apples or cherries or something. And then in the other corner is the possibility of having uh, a tiered garden, <coughs> excuse me, and we noticed today in our site visit that a lot of that wood timber is reaching the end of its life. So that's something we'll have to keep in mind, um, whether that some of that needs to be replaced with a more concrete block wall. And if that does, how do we do it in such a way that it would foster potentially having a community garden in the future? Um, so, and then the dog area, as Zane was mentioning, we're now calling the pet relief area. We know it's an important feature of the neighborhood. There's not a lot of other green space as you're walking down some of the sidewalks for your pet to go to the bathroom. So um, that remains in place. So 
So how supportive are you about some of these garden and orchard area potentials? Okay, so maybe not as excited as some of the other ones, but still some people think it's a good thing to pursue. Okay, thank you very much. All right, and moving on to the cultural and memorial spaces. All of these remain in place, but there are the possibilities of doing some enhancements. One of the ideas from the 2012 master plan was the addition of some flowering cherry trees and that easily could happen on that small berm behind where the empty chair memorial is. There also could be gateways to sort of demarcate when you enter this little zone, potential music in that space. And then this really lovely and striking totem, um, we're all trying to track down its story. Um, there is an interpretation panel next to it, but it's not about the totem. So per perhaps that's something that could be added and maybe make it a little bit more um, official off of the pathway with a little wayside. So these are um, enhancements that could occur with this project or phased at a later date as well. And then art, there's so many ways to integrate art in this project. We did hear a lot of comments to incorporate art. Uh, the photo on the top left is a very famous staircase in San Francisco, but the existing art um, mural that's on the playground area made me think of uh, this and maybe there's a scenario where we could um, utilize some of that or some other art on the stairs just like this. And then uh, sometimes we'll use the word art as infrastructure. If we are talking gateways, perhaps those become um, actual artistic features. And there's an example of a totemic carving. Um, there could be signage. And in this example from the community playground at Sitka, we actually hired an artist to do the graphics for the sign. Um, so it was a really, really, it was just, we had to put a sign up, but uh, we made it an, an actual art uh, project itself. And now down to some of the equipment. And we're gonna start with the taut area. These are all ideas We're we're not, to that level of design quite yet, but I just wanted to leave you with some of the ideas that we're thinking about. And in this taut area, we are looking at reusing the existing equipment, which includes sliding, crawling, balancing, and rocking, and then adding in some different elements, like some more balancing, some gathering places, and maybe some climbing on uh, like a traverse climb, nothing that would bring the kids up too high, but a traverse climb. And then this idea of swings for all, instead of having just two swings um, in that space, maximizing the capacity with these tandem style swings that can be in different seating configurations and certainly work for toddler size kids, kids with special needs, accessibility, adults, um, a whole range, um, teenagers, you know, everyone could use these swings, which is pretty exciting. And then um, I have picked three images to just start talking about the composite play structure idea. Thank you for your responses in the survey. So this option A was the example that was in the survey. It's definitely a more architectural style of um, play piece. Um, it is, it's fairly modern and new. Um, then if you look at option B, I'd say that's a more artistic style of playground equipment, but it also heavily features kind of the ropey, climby type of um, activities. And then option C, which is a more traditional approach with the post and platform style of play equipment, which you might be more familiar with. And I'll emphasize that these do not re represent our color choice or our material choices, um, but it's just I'm just gonna try and get an idea from you on what you might like. And I will note that there were a lot of responses against plastic, you know, having a real plasticky look. So all of these components can be um, changed with different materials 
roofs can be, um, you know, configured in different ways. We could have no roofs and um, metal slides are a definite option. Although I know they're cold, but kids, when they're wearing all of their outer gear, it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> so, so I think I'm going to ask, yes. Yeah, so next up is a poll question to see what you're thinking, what your preference is on those styles. So A was the architectural one, answer B is the more artistic represented one, and option C was the traditional post and platform style. And what's it gonna be? <laughs> Woo, pretty definitive. Okay, the Ionics went really through the roof. Okay, that is great to know. <laughs> and there's so many different components and elements um, that we can work with within that system. So wonderful. So it is a happy talent to know how to play. So thank you for joining us here tonight. Um, let's see, I think the next page we have some resources. Yes, so here is the project website address in case you didn't have it. And at this time, we wanted to make sure that you don't leave before we do the questions. And if you want to add your email address, the Zoom chat box is available for you to type in your email address. And we wanted you to know that it would only be used for this project. It wouldn't become part of any sort of citywide database system. So perfect. And now we're gonna be opening up for questions and I'll, um, Zane's gonna be moderating and kind of pitching it to members of the project team as needed. Yeah, thank you, Monique, that was, that was fun. Um, thank you for walking us through all those options and, and here we are to the overall concept. So um, if you could type the questions that you have for us in the Q&A function, um, it's gonna be on the taskbar of your Zoom meeting. Um, if you have trouble, um, um, there's a raise hand feature or other things. And I think uh, Michael mentioned some um, dial-in options if you're on a dial-in phone. But uh, to get started, we do have um, a few questions um, for us. There was one, um, I guess it's a, a little more of a comment just to, to say thank you for the project they had to leave early for planning commission, which is a good thing. Um, but they were pleased to see that it was a similar process and that it's a neighborhood use park and that they that we were taking community input. So so thank you. And and just to reiterate that we we value community input. It's it's sort of what helps us make our decisions. So so thank you very much for that. Um, one particular that came in, Monique, um, talking about the the tots next to the basketball area and maybe this sort of whole playground area. So where might parents sit? to keep an eye on their tots or older kids at the same time. So how does that dynamic work in this office? Okay, great. And I'll have you use your cursor to point out. Um, so there would be a separation fence between the basketball and the tot area. And then where that label picnic classroom, there'll be um, some seating options in that area. And then actually within the playground itself. So there'd be a, you know, a, probably two or three benches within that play piece or in that between inside that fence tot area, um, as well as probably over on the composite structure area, maybe a few benches in there. And then on that upper terrace, there's the ability to have some seating options if you wanted to be up above looking down. Um, another, I'll say this is maybe more of a comment that came in, but uh, that they liked community gardens um, and they're not opposed to turf um, as long as we can keep the dog poop off of it. But maybe you can can mention and maybe give another plug even for what could potentially be community garden or even could we call this community orchard? And have you seen um, those uses and how they work in the past with, with community organizations? Well, I'll start answering this and then maybe Michelle can talk from a park and rec uh, management point of view. So, uh, they're you know, fairly straightforward to design. The devil is in the maintenance and management of them. And I know that there are community gardens at the nearby Chicken Yard Park. So that could serve as an example for here 
Um, but I think that usually having a project partner or someone who's willing to do the kind of maintenance and management of the people using it is, is an important part of this process. So Michelle, do you wanna chime in from Parks and Rec side? Sure, I can just say we generally partner with the Cooperative Extension Service. Um, they do a lot of the facilitation of um, working with the community with on, on community gardens. We usually have some kind of agreement with them um, for parkland. That's probably what this situation would look like. And um, we know that there's interest out there and I've actually already talked with them a little bit about it. So um, whether or not there's you know funding to build the infrastructure in this phase, I don't, we don't know yet, um, but I think it's a really great opportunity as well for a volunteer project. Um, so I think there's lots of ways to, to make it happen. Thanks. Great, thank you. So another one that came in, um, since we're reconfiguring the retaining wall, and maybe you can explain some of the, the features that we're not gonna move, but um, there's some concern on the sledding hill. People really like it and is what it sounds like, and they don't want that compressed any more than it is. So maybe Monique, you can tell us a little bit about, we didn't really get into it, but an existing retaining wall here between the current basketball area and the sledding hill, and, and if that's gonna change. Unmute. Um, so yeah, so if you can drag your cursor again, that existing wall that's painted green, um, that it's called a wing wall, and the structural engineers feel that can remain, that it's um, in very good shape. So the actual configuration of the sledding hill doesn't change. In fact, we added just a tiny bit of additional runout space. And then the way it is configured and the way we model the terrain, there's a possibility where you could sled over into, you know, across the path and into the lawn area when you have snow, um, which I know this year has been a very low snow year. So <laughs> we're all looking forward to having that snow. It has, <laughs> and then, yeah. Yeah, so from the, um, the upper path, the access would remain the same where you'd be able to walk and access the sledding hill from that gap as well. Yeah, it, it, uh, as our walk around, it looks like quite the luge there for sledders. It looks like a really fun sledding hill. So mm -hmm. yeah, thank, thank you for clarifying that, that Monique. Um, another question, and this might be um, for Michelle as well, um, but is there any um, possibility of flooding part of the park for an ice skating rink in those freezing temps of the winter? Sure, thanks. Yeah, that, that comes up a lot and, and I bring it up a lot because I'm always interested in that option too. Um, so yes, there is. I mean, we would have to probably either build some infrastructure for it or um, there are these systems we're actually looking at this winter where you can buy these kind of temporary uh, systems that you set up um, and they, you know, involve compressors and generators and things, some of the systems um, and, and so we're starting to learn a little bit about them. Um, and what we're learning is, because um, there was some experimentation done on them in Juneau years ago, is that it actually takes very cold temperatures to make it work, colder than we have, um, to get the ice to set. So, so uh, my answer is yes, it's an option. Yes, we want to do it. Yes, we're looking into it. And I don't know if we can. So um, let's keep the conversation going on it. Good answer. Yeah, thank you. It, it is a tough one. So thank you very much. So here's one that's a, a kind of a comment and a question. Um, the, the, what we're calling the pet relief area, the dog area is pretty small, they think. And so could that maybe be an extended sledding hill um, or, or used for something else? And Monique, would you like to take this one? I'll start it. Um, anything is possible with design, um, but I know that the neighborhood uses that area now, um, taking it away might cause some unrest, but it's certainly something that design, yes, we could um, take over that space and make it more, um, you know, apportion it to the sledding hill, but I'm not sure that it is um, what the will of the neighborhood is. I'll jump in here quickly too, just um, because we work a lot with dog owners and, and there's a dog advocacy group we work a lot with in Juneau um, that part actually partners with us on 
helping with removing um, pet waste. And um, I think that that area, even though it's small and it, it seems undersized, actually does get a lot of use for pets um, and, and maybe helps in some ways to take some of the pressure off other areas, although we, we definitely realize there's problems with pet waste everywhere. So I, I'd be worried to take that away that it might um, move the problem even more to other areas. So although it is small, I, I think that it does serve the need in the community quite a bit right now. Great, thanks. And maybe just to a little further go on that before I switch gears, there was one more that came in just about, are we concerned about dog waste being above a sledding hill? But maybe you can just, just reiterate um, how, how Parks and Rec has dealt with um, dog waste. Sure, yeah, I, I saw that comment or question and I think it was coming from the perspective maybe of um, drainage and, you know, just a health and safety issue of it of you know, the topography of the waste being above the hill. And, and um, that's a great question. And I'll, I'll look a little bit more carefully up there. And as we design, think about that. But right now, I don't think that there's actual sheet flow water coming down off of it. Um, I think what happens is that um, the water is actually infiltrating over time. It may puddle and take some time into the grass and the soil, which is what we wanted to do because um, biologically that'll um, take care of you know, any issues with the pet waste. Um, before it it leaches out anywhere else. So, but thanks for the comment and we will make sure in design that um, that's what's happening. Great, thank you. Um, a comment and maybe a question as well, um, talking about safety and uh, some of these walkways and, and bushes at the top of the park. And I think we, you know, noticed that a bit today walking around. Um, but uh, some of the low hanging branches or maybe even some of these areas that don't feel, feel safe that maybe some uh, nefarious folks could hang out in. Um, do you wanna talk a little about that and if there's gonna be any sort of security improvements for lack of a better word or um, you know, um, safety improvements of the park? That could be for both Monique and Michelle. I, I can start just, um, we actually had a on-site meeting this morning um, with the design team and our, our park and landscape maintenance um, crews. And um, we talked about that issue exactly. And, and for Parks and Rec, that's a, um, a main concern in all of our parks and something we spend a lot of time dealing with. Um, so we take it really seriously. And, and our discussion was about um, good design uh, strategies to um, minimize hiding areas. So. We were looking really closely at the vegetation and the walls and trying to keep things as open as possible. You know, obviously in a site with such extreme topography, um, you know, you can't eliminate, you can't have, if you had a, a completely flat open site, you could see every angle at every time or every corner from every angle. And, and we're not going to get that. Um, but we can be strategic in how sight lines work and where you can see. And, and what we find in our parks is, um, you know, bad behavior happens when um, people can hide because they don't want to be seen. So um, we're really uh, going to work to to open up sight lines and views um, for, for safety. Great, thank you. Um, I see a, a good Juno comment, speaking of characters in parks. Um, someone mentioned that there's bears in the park uh, with fruit trees being there in the fall. Um, um, so they, they're asking if any of those trees are going to be removed and replaced, and I think we'd mentioned that, but maybe you can talk about, um, and maybe this is also for, for Michelle or Monique, but um, what do you do with bears and the fruit trees in the park? Um, so, you know, I know that our uh, <laughs> park maintenance supervisor is listening in on this meeting, and he may know more than I do about it, but I, I don't hear a lot about calls that we get about bears in fruit trees and parks. And I'm not saying that they're not there, um, but we don't get um, uh, complaints or comments that it's, it's causing harm to people. I mean, we do get broken branches and things like that. Um, we do have bears everywhere. Obviously we don't wanna attract more bears than necessary, but we have a lot of fruit trees and fruit bushes and berry bushes in all of our parks. Um, so it's, it's just what we have. I mean, and honestly, in the in the neighborhood down there, there's a lot of bears. We know we hear stories about bears getting into people's trash in those neighborhoods all the time. So, 
Um, we don't want to attract more. Um, we already have fruit trees. So if people want to give us more comments about it, we're definitely open to, to hearing what people have to say for those who, who live nearby and, and deal with it. Great, thanks. Um, one question that came in and I can answer this one quickly is uh, about the existing retaining wall, if it's kept in place after the new wall is built. And uh, currently the way we're, we're thinking about it is yes, um, it, it does cost quite a bit to um, remove that wall just for demolition. So it's a lot easier and this new, new concept that Monique is showing us. Um, widens that uh, upper path area because it moves that wall, the new wall, out in front of the existing and we essentially just leave it in place, put in some some good drainage to make sure that there's no, you know, water pressure back there. So our engineers are really thinking of it and that seems like the most budget conscious decision for us at the moment. So there's that one. Um, there's a comment about uh, musical instruments and maybe being a little too loud um, for local sleepers just for us to be aware of. But here's a really good question, and um, this could be for both um, Monique or Michelle as well, but is there any local um, opportunity for the local community to build part of the park or install some exercise equipment, anything like that? Thanks. Um, yes, there's always opportunity. I, I am certain there's going to be things that we are not able to afford. There always are. Um, and that we'll be looking for community partners. Um, I'll bring up the Park Foundation, the nonprofit group I mentioned earlier that partners with the city um, to advocate and fundraise for parks and support parks. And um, they've been very interested in Capitol Park. And so um, you know, we've already had discussions um, about Capitol Park and other parks um, and collaborating together. So I think there will be opportunities and, and we'd love to hear from people who are interested. Um, generally, as you can imagine, uh, retaining wall work, um, some of the structural work is, is by contractors. We'll um, do that for a lot of reasons, but we have had volunteers install playground equipment um, art, all, all sorts of things. So yes, I think there could be lots of opportunity. Thanks. Great, thank you. So um, here's a, a, maybe a question and a comment on here, but um, it's asking why not have a Clinkett long house instead of replacing the historic portico uh, from the old building. And, and this person clarifies that, which was um, the former high school and then community college building and not a not a capital school. So, um, and they were apparently around um, when the school burned. And so those architectural features have no sentimental or artistic or cultural importance to them. Um, maybe uh, maybe uh, discuss a possible alternative to the, the portico or is this, are these just concepts now, Monique? Or what, what's uh, maybe some of your thought processes? Yes, there? yeah, these are just concepts. So I, I would love to hear more about that idea. Right, great, yeah, and that's <laughs> that's basically a great answer to that. We love hearing these comments, and and we're not, uh, you know, haven't uh, been as studied maybe as some of the locals in the area. Um, so very much appreciate these comments coming in, and and please tell us your stories and your thoughts and your memories, and we'd, we'd love to make those part of the design. Um, a question um, comes in, and I think we talked about this at the beginning, but has there been any preliminary cost estimates um, and is there a um, and especially for this retaining wall and will it eat up too much of the budget so maybe uh, Michelle or or Michael even could talk about the budget um, outline that we discussed at the beginning of the presentation Michael are you looking for your mute button I think I'll let yeah, you take yeah. that one yeah I had, yeah I had to get to it um, so the retaining wall is going to most likely be a significant portion of the budget. Um, it's going to require the concrete work. It's going to require um, a fair amount of, of, of earthwork. Uh, I think we're still working on those numbers with the structural engineer uh, on exactly what it will look like, uh, how much area is going to be affected. So that's still a bit of flux and, and truthfully, that cost is going to dictate some of the other things we can and can't do. Um, we have every intention of, of making significant improvements to other parts of the park. 
but um, depending on that how that goes, that may um, that may afford some more opportunities for community involvement uh, to help to um, to help uh, absorb some of the 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 cost on some of the other things like uh, like the community garden, for instance. Um, but um, it's hard to say right now um, exactly how much it will be, uh, but it's something we're looking at and we're, we're well aware of and uh, want everyone else to be aware that um, depending on how that goes, it, it may affect what else happens throughout the park. Great, thank you, Michael. And just to reiterate that from the design team as well, I think the uh, contractually as well, we, you know, we, we designed to a budget. So I think the city's done a great job outlining it for us. And I think um, the concepts that we've come up with so far have tried to take advantage of leaving the functional pieces in place and not disturbing them so we can focus on um, spending money in the right places. So um, thank you for that question. Uh, we have another comment and maybe you can explain it a little bit, um, just how the topography works. It might be a little misleading in this, but um, someone said uh, if we're designing a gate down here, um, be wary of the sledder so it's not a, a hazard. But um, as we were walking, maybe you can explain how this sledding hill and run out zone work, Monique. Yeah, and your cursor, you were doing an excellent job. There's sort of a, um, a bit of a concave shape for that sledding hill and where Zane's cursor is moving is the predominant flow of the sledding hill. But yes, absolutely. Um, that that's a that's a great question to not conflict with that sledding hill run out if we do decide to proceed with any sort of gate in that area. All right, so this question I might not quite understand, but it um, is talking. It says to maybe flip the benches along Fifth to face the other direction to eliminate the trail behind to avoid places to hide. So. I'm not quite sure if that um, is meaning these benches or or which, but um, maybe you can talk about if we feel that there's some places to hide along here, along Fifth Street, or if or if this generally feels um, fairly safe to us. Um, maybe Monique or Michelle on that one. Well, I think um, okay, yeah. So Zane, if you put your cursor where the label says the existing nice vegetation bed, there are some beautiful specimens in there but um, they are getting a little big for the space. And so that's one of the areas where I think parks maintenance staff were pointing out perhaps some selective removal in there will open up some sight lines so that if you were on that walkway, you can see into that open space very easily. Um, as far as flipping the benches, um, there would be maybe a chance to um, kind of mirror having benches on the other side as well. Um, yeah, so there's lots of possibilities. The, uh, it seems to me, and just from the walkthrough again today, that all of that is in very good condition. So it's not in imminent need of repair. Um, so it might be something that is looked at kind of um, down the line, but um, additional fence or additional benches in the area is certainly possible. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's really hard to tell from this image and we, we maybe should have had a good existing image, but um, Monique's exactly right. These are fairly, it's fairly easy to see over top of this right now currently. So, and along Fifth Street here, it's actually a, quite a bit lower than the park. It's a little misleading here, just looking at it from, from the air and plan, but uh, they're fairly low. So it's almost like a different uh, part of the park and maybe not even um, sort of included in the day-to-day -day uses of the park. Uh, we've got a question here about any consideration for outdoor performance area. Maybe some thoughts on that, Monique? Sure, and I'm conflicted. I love that idea, but I also read all of the comments about not really wanting a lot of additional noise generated from this park. So Maybe we need to, to talk more about that. Um, certainly this kind of central feature of the staircase could even become bigger and more like um, amphitheater seating style so that you could have um, some sort of performance venue built in. There would also be the opportunity, I think, in the lawn space 
to create that because essentially that's just a big open area, flexible um, and versatile for many types of uses. So um, there certainly couldn't, there would be no, um, it would be very possible to put up a little pop-up tent and to do kind of music on the lawn would be possible. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, and we're, we're getting down toward the end of these and it's also getting uh, somewhat close to 7.30. So we might uh, wanna wrap up here with just a couple more questions, but uh, one person was uh, good to notice and what I just discovered was the Gaga pit. Um, and they're asking, will it remain? Um, Monique and Michelle, maybe you can give us some, some uh, info on that. Uh, sure. The wonderful thing about Gaga pits is they can be picked up and put back super easily. Um, and so, yes, if people like it, it will remain. It will be picked up and brought away for construction and then <laughs> brought back and put down when it's done. Um, and right now, kids are loving Gaga ball and it's the craze. So, yes, we can keep a Gaga ball pit there. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I was... Um... I was excited to learn what that was when, uh, when we started this project. It was an interesting feature. Um, here's a question um, up here, um, maybe for Monique, but we've got a large, and, and they're calling it a noble cottonwood tree. Um, will it be removed and replaced with a, with a young one somewhere? Um, these folks say it does, the smell does herald spring. I love cottonwoods too. My understanding from the structural engineers is because of its location so close to the wall that it's likely um, to be removed. Right, thank you. Yeah, it, it is almost sitting on top of the wall and just for, for construction as is, it might be very tricky to save that one. So we'll see what we can do, but uh, that, that might might be. Um, but we um, since it is a loved one, we'll we'll definitely um, put in consideration for um, putting one in for the future. Um, so just a couple, it looks like mostly comments here coming in. There's some people saying that, uh, um, good job and thanks for the presentation. Some folks saying, don't be too hasty removing trees. They, re they create natural green zones and um, a few more thank yous. So, Again, everyone, will we will take these, we're, we're putting these comments as they come in and these questions in a Google Doc for us to, to save after the meeting. And that's what I've been reading as uh, Kevin has been really great about uh, sort of distilling these for us and grabbing them out of the Q&A. Um, and so we'll, we'll, I guess, wrap up the question and A right here and we'll, we'll take those. We'll also export this, this meeting for us to keep his record, but... Um, do we have any final comments maybe from Michael and Michelle um, to wrap up? Um, I'd, I'd just like to again thank everyone for their participation. Um, you know, we had a great, great participation in the survey, good participation tonight. Um, we, we really appreciate it. Your, your input, you know, certainly it helps to direct us to, to what, uh, what changes are made and what improvements are made to the park. Yeah, and I just wanted to say thanks to everyone. Um, we had a couple comments on um, volunteering and wanting to participate, and we love those ideas. So uh, reach out to us, um, reach out to the Park Foundation, and uh, we'd love to talk to you. So thank you. Okay, and thank you, everyone. And hopefully you can stay dry and warm on this uh, very blustery evening. Make sure to email us and uh, with any other questions and we're happy to happy to do our best. <laughs>